outside of last week when I talked about dating, um, and if you weren't here, you might want to listen to it because you might think, dating, why are we talking about dating in church? But we were talking about dating, not dating people, but dating God, and drawing some parallels and that kind of stuff. Um, but, I would, but I want to remind you, the weeks prior to that, we, we were talking about the faith of who? Rahab. We are talking about the faith of Rahab that she had and that she exhibited. And we, the aim of talking about her was trying to learn from her. Because how many of you know we all have faith and our faith needs to improve? And there's, there's stories in the Bible that helps us understand faith better. There's stories in the Bible that helps us to begin to grow in faith. That God's desire is that we grow in faith, not stay the same. And so what I want to do today with the time that we have is I want to now turn from looking at the faith of one person to now looking at the faith of a nation. And as we look at that, obviously a nation is made up of people, so there's faith of it, you as an individual in this place today. And there's also faith that we need to come together collectively for the vision that God's given us for this church. Are you guys with me so far? So we're going to look at this, this uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4. We probably won't get to 4 today. I have three points to make about faith. I'll probably only get through two. Um, and even with that, i got to get her in to, to get through two of them. Um, but I want to encourage you, listen and expect your faith to grow today. Expect yourself to leave here and then begin to take what you hear today. And this should happen, by the way, every week, every Sunday. We, we don't come just for me to blow hot air at you or whatever. We come to learn God's word. And the purpose of learning God's word is to apply it to our life. And as we apply it to our life, we grow, we change, our faith grows, everything changes about us. It's necessary. Coming just to hear isn't going to change your life. Application of what you hear will change your life today. Amen? So let's just jump right on into it. And so the first point that I want to make, and what I'm going to do is I've been reading a lot of scripture all at once. Well, this time I'm just going to give you the points. I'm going to read the scriptures out of it that applied. So we're going to mainly look today at uh, Joshua 3, verses 1 through 17, I believe it is. And I would encourage you um, sometime this week to go back through that and read. And I believe as you read, it will help stimulate your mind, if you don't take notes, to remember some of these things that we're going to talk about. So the first thing, when we start looking at this story and looking at uh, these three areas of faith, the first thing uh, is, is that, and I'm going to show you here, the first point that I want to show you is that there was messages that God gave the people. And he gave those messages either through the uh, officials that were helping or we, we would call them maybe elders or, or deacons in the church um, that went. went um, he gave it through Joshua. And obviously God himself, spoke, God himself was speaking all along. And so one of the things that we need to come back to in the simplicity of faith is that faith always starts with a word. Okay? Faith always starts with a word. Now, we all have these things right here, and if you don't have this in hand, you usually will have some sort of an electronic device that will have this on it, right? But this is God's Word, right? And, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence today. What I'm trying to do is get us back to some basics. This is God's Word. This Word shows His heart. This Word shows His promises. This Word shows us everything we need to know to be successful in this world. And now listen, no matter how dark it is, we can still be successful if we take this word and begin to apply it to our life. That's why, as I keep plugging Sunday after Sunday, we've got to be in our word. We've got to know what God's word is. We've got to know what it says. There's false doctrines out there right now. There's false teachers out there. And they're saying things that are contrary to the word of God. And if you don't know, you will get swept away in, in uh, a river, a stream of things that aren't biblical. And you know what? People are really good about making unbiblical things sound really good. And I'll remind you of things that I've said over the years. If there's anything that you hear doctrinally out there in the, the stream of the Internet, if it causes you to fulfill your flesh, it's a, it's a doctrine of demons. Because the Word of God's always going to call us to this place of crucifying our flesh. Not glorying in our flesh, not glorying in the things of this world, but glor glorying in the crucifixion of our flesh and glorying in Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? So, look at these verses here. Um, the, the officer's message to the people. Joshua 3, verse 1 through 4. It says, Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped there before crossing. Three days later, the Israelites' officers went through the camp. 
giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, move out from your position and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. So as we read this, we see something very specific. There's a very specific word that's been given here to the people, right? It's very specific. It's not vague. It's not unclear. It's very to the point. And obviously this word that they're giving isn't something they just drummed up. This is something that God would have spoke to Joshua. Joshua would have spoke it to the, to the, the people that helped him run the nation, and then they would assimilate that out to a million people. Imagine that, a million people. And so God... Uh, is using this, and he's giving them a word. And so if you remember right, um, just, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, Joshua sent two spies to Jericho to spy out the land, remember? And they came back at the end of all that that we talked about in the faith of Rahab. They came back. And I love how this starts out. The next day. Everybody say next day. The next day, the people are now moving. Why does that speak so much to me? Because there wasn't a delay. Remember in the past, when, remember uh, in, in, in Israel's past when the, the 12 came back and there was such a negative report? Moses still, as a leader, could have went, we're leaving, let's go. But the more negative things that you start hearing, the more things at the times the enemy comes in and steals what the Lord has spoken, the less you move. And sometimes success is responding quickly. Sometimes success is the Lord spoke it, I'm going to go do it. But here's the thing, you got to have a faith to believe that. And if your faith isn't growing, odds are you're going to let the enemy take that seed or that word that the Lord has spoken into your life or, or through your life or even in your Bible reading. The enemy wants to come in and choke out the word. Faith has got to be stronger than that. Faith has got to be at a place where, where we can understand the schemes of the enemy, combat those with the word of God, and still move forward in the things of God. And so I love it. Immediately the next day, they get up and now they're marching. Come on. Maybe there's some of you in here today that need to get up and start marching towards what God's already told you to do. Watch this. Sometimes we're waiting for God to speak something new. I want to just simply tell you this today. God's not going to give you something new if you can't already do what he's asked you to do. But, you know, sometimes we start dreaming, right? How many of you have ever dreamed about what life could be as a Christian and how God could use us? Anybody ever do that? Come on, you should be doing that, right? But let's, let's not do this. Let's not start dreaming about how God could do. Let's start doing what he's already asked us to do. And then let's start dreaming from there. Because God is actually waiting for us to step out. He's actually waiting for us to take that leap of faith and step into the things that he's called you to do personally. Maybe it's at your work. Maybe it's at different uh, things that you're involved in in the community. Maybe it's here at the church. Are you with me today? Good. So I love that, that they immediately began to go. I love this too. Looking back at, at the days of when Moses was leading, um, God promised Moses this in Exodus 33, 14. He says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. That's the God we serve. His presence will go with us. His presence will actually lead us. And when we follow, watch now, we get rest. Might I in interject a thought here today? Maybe there's some of us in here that aren't at rest because we haven't been doing what God's wanting us to do. Peace isn't there because really we're battling against what God's wanting to do in our life. And I look across this room from here all the way over to here. God is wanting to do something in all of your lives. He's wanting to do something in my life today. I was praying during, during um, worship this morning just for the service and, and just worship and that God's presence would, would hit this place hard, that we would tangibly feel God's presence. Why do I do that? Why? Because he will do it. His presence is here. We're two or three are gathered in his name. He's here. We've already had pre-service prayer. We've already invited. We've already prayed things through for the morning service. But we come, come expecting for God to do great things in your life. God knows you better than anybody else. He knows your ins and outs. He knows exactly how to speak to you in worship that nobody else can do in this place today. 
God's presence is amazing. And his presence wants to lead and his presence wants to guide. Amen? So we see that as soon as they picked up that ark and started going, the people followed. And now the second point, the, the second thing, this is Joshua's message to the people, verse 5. L listen to this. Then Joshua told the people, purify, some, some translations will say sanctify, yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Everybody say great wonders. Do you know we have a God that wants to do great wonders? We have a God that wants to do great wonders. The God of the Old Testament and the things that he did is the same God, God today. The God that, that moves so mightily when Jesus walked this earth and in the early church is the same God today. What has changed? Nothing. God is still the same, yesterday, today, and forever. The thing that has changed is man's expectation. That's the thing that has changed, is his, our expectation of who he is. And our life sometimes is the book that, that diminishes our faith. Things that happen in our life, we, we, we struggle to understand them, and it, we allow the enemy to use those struggles to begin to kill our faith. Do you know you could sit in this church today, looking very much alive today, but be dead in your faith? And that's just not here. That's all across this nation. It's all across the world. See, we become professional Christians. We know how to play the game. We know how to go to church and look good. But meanwhile, inside we're dying. Can I say this today? That's not God's plan. That's not God's purpose for your life. God actually wants all of us to go onward and upward. Because he's got great things for you. He's got great things for this church. And we've got to step into it. And so Joshua began to speak this word. God, Joshua's actually giving them an order here. Go sanctify or purify yourself. You see something here? There's an order, but now look at the, what the blessing is because God's going to do wonders among you. You catch that? God, if we purify ourselves and separate ourselves, God will do wonders among us. And I'm not sitting here today that there's some formula out there because God is God and God will do what he wants. But usually when we purify ourselves, and we humble ourselves, and I'll look, we'll look into that word here in a minute, it opens up God's heart to move. And I actually believe it doesn't open up his heart to move as though it was closed off. I believe what it does is it opens up our heart. We prepare ourselves for God to do wonders when we purify and cleanse ourselves. Sometimes we see in Scripture uh, that the, there are just promises all through this Bible about God and things that God will do. And some of them are just simply this. We just have to believe it. We just have to have faith to believe it. There's no condition applied to it at all. But there's also promises in the Bible that has an if to it. Have you come across those as you read? If you do this, then I will do this. It's a condition. The condition is based on your obedience to do the if. The blessing of it comes if you do that, God will do his part. So the equation, if you want to use that word, works this way. If we don't, God doesn't have to. But if we will, God will. Here's the thing. God remains faithful, always. Always remains faithful to his word. Again, the issue isn't God. The issue is us. <laughs> but I'm thankful for his grace because it's his grace that empowers us to change. It's his grace that gives us the ability to go from here to there, from grace to grace, even as we sing that song today from grace to grace, from glory to glory. We're changing day by day as we submit our life to him. It's a given. If we'll do things, God will also do things. And then again, there's other things that are just promises that God's going to do, and there's no condition on it because it's talking about now who he is. So look at this word sanctified. Sanctified in the Bible carries these meanings, okay? Be holy, to consecrate, prepare, dedicate, to cleanse. And so I would, I would just simply say this out of those words, to make it real simple today, it's just saying, get serious with the Lord. Right? Get serious. How many of us need to just get serious with the Lord? You know, sometimes the cares of the world get in, and it actually takes away our devotion. It takes away our heart for the Lord. And sometimes we just have to come and do, look in the mirror and go, you know, i got to get serious with the Lord today. 
I'm going to start somewhere. I'm going to start today, and I'm going to start getting serious with the Lord. But here's the thing that I want to really focus on here. Because as, as I was pondering uh, this word sanctify and, and uh, purify, uh, for us in here today, I'm not going to focus so much on the holy and, and that kind of stuff. And, and understand, I'm not taking anything away from that word. I understand the word sanctify. I understand this, the, the word purify. But I really felt as I was meditating upon this, based on the rest of the scripture, they had to dedicate themselves. They had to dedicate themselves and prepare themselves. And as I began to ponder that, I really felt like what the Lord was speaking um, to me is this. If you don't prepare our, ourselves for the wonders of God, we will not have the faith to believe God to do the wonders. Do you know when we come to church, we have to prepare our heart to come, right? And as we prepare our heart, we come in more spiritually tuned to what God's doing in the service. We actually become more spiritually in tune to the presence of God being here. But you have to prepare yourself for that. You have to come already cleansed yourself, right? And I'm just giving you a scenario for what works best, okay? You don't have to do this. You can come in every Sunday just as you are. God's going to love you, and he'll do a work in you nonetheless. But there's a difference when we come and we have prepared ourselves to be here. We're just more sensitive to God's presence. And actually what it does is when a whole congregation gets together and we prepare ourselves faithfully when we come to church, what it actually does is it opens up the atmosphere for miracles to take place in the service because we're expecting it. Come on. When we expect, God shows up. When we just show up, God's still here, but we just don't see it like we would because we didn't prepare ourselves. And then they also had to dedicate themselves. And, and as I just begin to think about that word, you know, we got to dedicate ourselves to a God who wants to do wonders. I'm going to ask a question I don't want an answer. Uh, you answered that this week between you and God. Do you really believe today that God is a God of wonders? We can nod our head. And watch this. We can nod our head because that's the right answer. It is. It's the right answer. If I don't nod my head, then I don't have faith. Well, we can nod our head and still not have faith to believe that he wants to do wonders. And I'm not picking on anybody today, trust me. I'm in my own journey just like you guys are in your own journey, and God's doing a work in, in, in me, and he's going to continue to do a work in me. He's doing a work in you, and he's going to continue to do a work in you. But sometimes we just got to come to church on a Sunday morning prepared, dedicated, and expect the greatness of God to show up. We create an atmosphere of expectation when we come prepared and dedicated. Prepared and dedicated. And here's the thing. If we don't prepare and ded dedicate ourselves to something like God and his wonders, something else is going to fill that space. Something always has to fill space in our life. This just comes to me right now. You know, Holy Spirit, uh, in Hebrews, when it's talking about the word is sharper than any two-edged two -edged sword, right? And it divides the soul and spirit. When you divide the soul and spirit with the, with the word of God, it creates space. Something has to fill that space. It's either going to be flesh or it's going to be spirit. And when spirit fills that space, it's a powerful thing. The word, the word of God just became life in you. But if the flesh fills that space, it just gets itself stronger. And how many of you ever had a, a scar that's kind of uh, ribbed and it's very, there's just a lot of scar tissue? Is I believe when we don't allow spirit to take that space, we become scarred. And the longer we become scarred, the more that, that, that uh, scar becomes really raised and very thick. Now, it's never too late. God can remove those scars. Amen? Doesn't matter. God can remove it as we come to a place of humbling ourselves before his mighty hand. I love this scripture, Psalm 7, 77, verses 13 and 14. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. Come on. That's our God. How about this one? Daniel 4, 3 says this. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. Church, this is the God we serve. This is a God we serve. And like I said earlier, what he used to do is the same as he is today. 
and he's wanting to reveal his wonders into the world. He wants to show you his wonders. Maybe he wants to refresh your memory with something new today. But you got to dedicate and you got to give yourself to the Lord. You got to begin to have a faith that begins to look up instead of looking down. The world doesn't want to see any more Christians walking around with their head down on the ground going, woe is me. Come on, they want to see a joyful filled people. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. They prayed about that this morning in, in pre service prayer. The joy of the Lord is that we should be the happiest people on the planet. We shouldn't be outdone by rich people who don't love God but have all the things of the world that they ever want. We should be, we should be outdoing them because in the end, all that burns up. In the end, they still don't have God. We do. So we need to come and love on those people and be Christ to them and show them that there's something more than money and riches and possessions in this world. Another thing about sanctification in, in the Bible is it carries this, this idea of showering and redressing or taking a bath and putting on new clothes. And you see that when, when the people of Israel came out of Egypt and they're at Mount Sinai, God began to speak. After God spoke, they went, they cleansed themselves, and they put on new clothes. You see that when David uh, confessed his sins to Nathan, I believe it was. Um, when he got done doing that, he went, he sanctified himself, he cleansed himself, he took a bath, and put on new clothes. What does that all mean? It simply means this, with God there's new beginnings. Come on, with God, we can begin to start over again. To God, if we're at a place where we find ourselves, where we're shrinking back instead of moving ahead, we can start new again. But the prescription is this, purify yourself. Put on new clothes. His grace and his mercy and his forgiveness is there. And he says, new beginning. Let's start fresh and new today. I believe there might be some in here today that needs a new beginning. And your answer today is simply this. Humble yourself before his mighty hand. Humble yourself before his, his love, his grace, and his mercy. Allow him to wash you this morning. Come on. Allow, you, allow him to wash you this morning to put a new robe on you, if you will, and then start off into a new course. A course following him. Not a course back off this direction, but a course following him. And you know what? It may be hard for you today to get back on course, but trust him that his grace is with you and that he'll lead the way. But today is the day, not tomorrow, not next week, I'll do it here, there. No, today is the day to have a new beginning. So then you have Joshua's message to the priests. Joshua 3, 6, in the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. You gotta love the priests, huh? They're the ones that gotta carry the Ark, which is a good thing because it was the presence of God. But they were the first one that had to step in the water. The people didn't step in the water. The priest had to step in the water. And I love this because what it speaks to me is this. Leaders in the church need to set the example of faith. Not that leaders in the church don't have to struggle with their faith from time to time with different things that God's working through their life, but we need to lead. Church leaders, church elders, people who lead, man, I want to encourage you to grow your faith. Let God's word fertilize it. Take it to another level because God wants to take it to another level. Because we have to be the ones to, to set an example for the rest of all. And that's exactly what these priests did. They set an example. They followed the orders that they were given and they stepped in the, in, into the river. Come on. Leaders out there, I'm calling you higher because God's calling you higher. Allow him to do a work in your faith because faith is what's going to get us to the next over to the other side, amen? Just, just so you know, I'm not picking on leaders in the church, but I'm going to pick on all of us today real quick because I'm going to throw a scripture out to you. Just in, just in case if you're thinking right now, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a priest, I'm not an elder, I'm not a deacon. I got a scripture for you. 1 Peter 2.5. <laughs> and you, ever say me, are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Boom, there it is. It's just not for the few, it's for all of us. We are his priests. 
Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Can I say this? And I don't, again, I don't mean to insult you. You are a priest unto God. And God is calling you to step out into something new. And if we don't do it, you will never see it. You'll never see the wonders of God. You'll hear about it. You may witness it from afar, but it won't have the same feeling than if you're the one leading. And you know what? There's people out there that you come in contact with who actually needs a priest. They need a pastor. Because this world is hurting right now. And all they need is some hope. Come on. We have the hope. We have the hope of the world, and that's Jesus. We have the hope of the cross and the life that that brings. And God's calling you as a priest to step out. Step out. Okay, moving on. The me- I got to get moving here. The message of the Lord to Joshua. So now the Lord is speaking to Joshua. It says this uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the, of the Covenant. When they reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So what God did with Moses, God was now going to do with Joshua. Josh, God was calling Joshua to another level. Not, not a helper to, to, to Moses, but now the leader of a nation. Understand that he just didn't step into that. He didn't win some sort of a lottery or something like that. God was grooming him along the way to be a leader. See, you can be born a leader, but God has to develop that. God can call you to be a leader, but that still has to be developed. God has called me to be a leader. It's, trust me, it's still getting developed. And it will still continue to get developed. Because God's not going to call me to be a leader and go, hey, you're on your own. Figure it out. And sometimes, unfortunately, you learn by mistake. But a good leader learns from the mistakes, right? Instead of continuing to repeat them over and over again. And so um, so jo- Joshua was being called higher. God was going to use him. But God was going to reveal it to the people. Amen? And so God had given Joshua authority over the people. And one of the things that I like about Joshua, and we'll see here in this next point, Joshua wasn't fooled himself. He wasn't. He had wandered for 40 years with the rest of them. Not by his choice, but he still wandered. And he still supported Moses. But he wasn't prideful. He wasn't arrogant. That Look, God picked me. Because it's not a place of pride. It's actually a place of humility. That God would pick anybody to use, to lead anybody, right? And so we see here the next thing, Joshua's message to the people. So Joshua 3, 9 through through, through 13, it says, So Joshua told the Israelites, Come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out all these people ahead of you. Look at the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth. We'll lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men of the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priest will carry the ark, the Lord of all the earth. The ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. So look what Joshua did. Okay, obviously, the, the verses before that, God is, is telling them, that, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them that you are the leader. Right? But when he begins to address the people, he doesn't go out and go, hey, I'm the leader now. Follow me. What he did was he magnified God. Every good leader will not elevate themselves. They'll elevate God. They'll elevate Jesus. They'll elevate the cross. Because this isn't about any leader. This is all about God. You know, we have leaders today that, that I just wonder I wonder if they're building their ministry on themselves because they're charismatic people. And it's not necessarily being built on God. And more and more I I see things throughout the world because God's doing great things throughout the world, church. And I see that God's doing great things in Africa. 
But you come across these things where you see great leaders build great churches, but then they fall of moral failure. And you have to wonder, were they building it upon God or were they building it upon themselves? You know, it was funny when, when Megan was talking about uh, stri striking the rock um, and the water came out. You know what came to my mind when I was thinking about that? It just shot right in my mind. When we hit the rock in our own strength, all you get is fragment pieces hitting you in the face. That's all you get. You don't get water out of the rock. You get fragments hitting you. I wonder... How, much, how many ministries today are built upon men and not upon God? It's the question you've got to ask yourself. It's a question I've got to ask myself. And what I do, and, and I'm not the most charismatic person in the world. I don't make a good pom-pom cheerleader. He didn't magnify himself. He magnified God. Look at these words that he said. He said, God is the living God. God is the living God. As a living God, he will defeat the nations ahead of us. He won't just defeat them, but he will defeat their dead idols. Can I say this today to us as a church? That God is the living God. And he will defeat in your life those things that still hold you back. He will. He will defeat them. But we got to give them to him. Then he says this. Because he is the Lord of all the earth. Do you know as the Lord of all the earth, the creator of it all? He can do whatever he wants. And if he wants to elevate a nation, he can elevate a nation. If he wants to tear down a nation, he can tear down a nation. If he wants to remove a king and put a new king in, he can do it. Why? Because he's the king of the earth. He's the king of the universe. And when you've created it, you're the man. And as the man, you can do whatever you want. And one thing that I know about God, he's not fickle. He knows what he's doing. We may not understand it. We may look across the news and get all fearful because of the things that are going on, but God is in control. God knows what's going on. We just got to get our eyes focused on him and, let, and, and, and uh, uh, put to snuff, if you will, the enemy coming in and put fear over the Christian church. He wants to put fear in us and what's going on in the world today. But in the end... If something tragic happened, guess where we get to be? In glory. We have nothing to fear. Here's the thing. Maybe we fear because we're not where we're supposed to be with in our relationship with the Lord. Maybe that's why fear's there. What I love about Joshua, too, is he didn't get up when, he, when the Lord said, tell the people this. He didn't get up and do this religious pep talk. Come on, you hear me now? He didn't get up to give some religious pep talk. You know how easy it is to get it, well, not for me, you know how easy it is to get up and just do a pep talk? But you know a pep talk has no life in it? Because what it does is it stirs the emotion on an only emotional level. And that emotion quickly fades before people get to the parking lot to drive away. I don't ever want to be that guy who's got to do a spiritual pep talk on a Sunday morning. I want to be the guy like Joshua that will speak God's word and his promises and his blessings that flow from him and the goodness of God and be truthful with it. See, I could have got, gotten up here today and given you a pep talk and left out sanctification. I could have left out about sanctifying ourselves. I could have left out about, oh, your faith doesn't need to grow. And I and just gave you a pep talk and got you all stirred up in the flesh. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the Word of God penetrating your heart and changing you. Because that is why I'm here. I don't make a good cheerleader. I need to get better at it in some ways, but I don't make a good cheerleader. I make a, what God's called me to do is just simply preach the Word and leave it at preaching the Word. He's called me to bring you to the water of living, the, the, the living water, and then He's put it on you to bend down and drink. I can't make you drink. No elder in this place can make you drink. Can I go out on a limb and say this? God won't even put his hand on the back of your neck and force you to drink. It's got to come from you. It's got to come deep from the thing in that says, I want to drink of the living water. Come on. God is a good God. And I must confess right now, I lied. 
all night. We're only going to get through one point today. <laughs> Gosh, where does time go? Or at least it goes for me. You guys might be going, dear Lord, end it already. But man, it's like time's already over. You're hungry. I just fed you the full meal deal. That's dessert. Yes. <laughs> hey, why don't we stand to our feet? <laughs> The good thing is, here's the funny thing. As, as the pastor, if I don't get finished in one week, I have next week. <laughs> I really feel sorry for those that speak for me when I'm not here because they don't always have next week. <laughs> and so if they're, most of them are like me, they over-prepare. But when you're doing one week, you can't really over-prepare and stuff. So it's a lot, a lot harder when you're getting up here for just one week um, sharing what God's put on your heart. But Nonetheless, God is good. Can I hear an amen? amen? Come on. Where are you at today? Not, not like, I'm at 1631 Northeast Franklin Avenue, a live church. No, where are you at with your walk with the Lord? Seriously, and this is, this is what I'm going to ask all of us to do this week. I'm going to ask you to ponder that question. Ask the Lord because he knows sometimes better than we know. Come on, sometimes... Pride keeps us from seeing ourselves clearly in the mirror. Come on. It's true. Ask yourself, Lord, show me where I'm at today. And then have a heart that is dedicated and prepared to receive what he wants to say. Because he will fill that blank in for you. And if he has some discipline, embrace it. Because scripture says that he disciplines those that he loves. And truthfully, I'd rather be disciplined from him than from my mother. Uh-huh. When that belt came out, it was going to hurt. Amen. No, don't amen that. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we give you praise and glory today. Father, it is you that we even come here is to meet with you, to worship you, to pray, to intercede, Father, and to hear your word. Father, I pray that you'll keep this message before all of us this week. That, Father, throughout the week, you just drop in nuggets of this message. That, Father, even as they read chapters th chapter 3, Father, even as they read chapter 3, Father, begin to speak and to remind our spirit, our heart, and our mind this message today. Father, thank you that you are calling us upwards and onwards. Father, as we'll see next week, Lord God, you call us out of things to bring us into something new. Father, just as you called us out of Olympic High School, you're bringing us out of there, but Lord, not to be the same, but to come into something new. And Father, I pray right now over this whole congregation that, Father, we will embrace the new. That, Father, we will embrace what you want to do. Not what we want to do, what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen.